Hello and welcome. Today we're going to fly through a bunch of information about cameras. Get ready, strap in, and learn, learn, learn. The first thing on the camera handout is the lens. The lens is the eye of the camera. Now, here is a real lens. It's a lens for a photo camera, a DSLR. There's the front end, and this, very carefully, is the back end that straps onto the camera. Don't want to expose that to dust or other particles in the air. A real lens has glass. It has optical elements that allow it to create an image. If you look at your phone, that doesn't. Your phone, if you look at it, doesn't have an actual lens. That is just a sensor with a piece of glass over it to protect it. But it's not a real lens. Another way that you know that your phone doesn't have a real lens is that when you try to zoom in, whoop, it digitally zooms in. It takes a picture, because that's all it has is one picture, and it digitally zooms in on that picture. And what happens when we digitally zoom in, kids? It pixelates, and it looks horrible. So the first thing I'm going to teach you about, related to the lens being the eye of the camera, is that if you want to get zoomed in, you have to do it physically. You have to physically move closer. So here I am, I'm this far away, and it's just too wide of a shot. I want to get closer. I can't digitally zoom, so I'm going to zoom with my feet. I'm going to physically move in closer. Now there's something else that we need to think about when we think about the lens being the eye of the camera. Most of you have grown up in a world where you have had these devices in your back pocket that can shoot magnificent pictures and videos. And something's going on in your life, maybe your friends are doing something funny and you whip this out and you're like, hold on, boop, I recorded this. Oh, <laughs> that was hilarious. Everything that you've done so far in your life with this phone camera has probably been at eye level. When you shoot everything at eye level, all you're doing is witnessing what goes on in the world around you. That's all. You're just recording what your eyeballs would see when everything you shoot is here. So when we think about the lens of the camera being the eye of the camera, I want you to open up your creative mind and start thinking about how your eyeballs that are in your skull and attached to your body are limited to wherever your skull is. This camera is not. Any camera is not. You can move around with a camera in a way that your head and your eyeballs cannot move. So when you have a camera and that eye of the camera is able to look at things, start thinking about how you can look at things differently. And a simple example would be this. I'm standing on ground right now and my head is here. So everything that I look at, if my head was a camera, everything I look at is from this position. But this could go up here. It could go down here. It could go around corners. It could do movements that my head could not really do that easily. So when we think of the lens being the eye, remember that when you have a camera, it can do more than just what your eyes and your head can do. OK, next thing on the list is the body. The body of a camera is like the brains. It does all the real work. So again, here's a DSLR. There's a lens, this is a body. All the things inside of this body are what make your image. This is glass. This glass lets light through. That's all it does. This is the real operation, man. This is where the real magic happens. And when you think about what a camera can actually do, the fact that it can record reality, when you think about the power of that thing in your back pocket to document reality, that's massive. If you went back 100 years ago in time and told somebody that you had a device in your back pocket that could access all of the world's information, record reality, paint a picture, um, record and playback sound, uh, play games, I mean, like, there's no limit to what this thing could do. You, they'd burn you at the stake because of magic and witches. So it's a very powerful thing. And the body of the camera is what really does all the work to take that light information that comes through the lens and turn it into a picture or moving pictures like video. Okay, the filter on a camera. Now, 
Your phone probably doesn't have a filter built into it. It's automatic. But a professional camera does. And a filter basically is like a set of sunglasses or maybe blue blockers, right? It's not part of the lens and it's not part of the body. It's kind of an in-between. But it kind of cuts down the amount of light coming through. So if you're outside on a really sunny day, you might put on sunglasses. Well, a professional camera has a filter. So flip the filter switch, Dave. So this is one stop of filter. You'll notice that the image overall cut down pretty, pretty significantly the amount of light. And it's not just dark, it's also kind of gray. Do you guys notice how it, it took away some of the color? Okay, but if we were outside on this gloriously hot sunny day, you would still see more than enough image. But with just inside fluorescent lighting and one stop of filter, that cuts down quite a bit of light. Go ahead and flip the switch to the next one. Here we are and we're really dark now, right? You guys can see that that's a significant stop. Go to the full blast. At this point, you could just barely maybe see the outline of my existence. Let's talk about white balance. So white balance is, again, probably something integrated as an automatic feature if you're shooting video with a phone. You don't have to think about it because the phone app, that works with the sensor and it basically automatically determines what kind of light you're shooting in and it adjusts your white balance automatically. But on any other kind of camera with manual control, so like a DSLR or a camcorder or a professional broadcast video camera, you have to tell the camera what kind of light you are using. And what I mean by the kind of light is light has a different color temperature. So usually this spectrum is like in the mid 2000s all the way up to the 5000s or maybe even 6000 on the higher end. Um, and some of the kind of common um, settings would be inside lighting, like fluorescent lighting or incandescent lighting, and that usually falls in the spectrum of about 3200 Kelvin. So this is a little bit of science sprinkled in here, but Kelvin, K-E-L-V-I-N. And that color range, that color temperature of about 3200 is one of the main white balance settings because it's one of the most prevalent kind of indoor lighting color temperatures that you could have. Now, on the flip side, you have outside lighting, and usually the sun outside lighting on a sunny day like this, you'd set your white balance at 5600 Kelvin. So what's the difference? Well, if you're using a phone, you probably have auto white balance. So I'm going to show you from our professional camera what happens when you manually control white balance. So right now, Carafa has the camera set on 3200 Kelvin because we have fluorescent lights. Now, I want you to pan, uh, tilt up, Dave, and show them, you know, just like in any classroom, there's your, your generic fluorescent classroom lights, right? And they look white. So now Dave's going to switch the white balance to outdoor lighting you'll notice that I look suddenly very tan. You'll notice that the ceiling, the tiles look very yellow, right? Everything kind of has this yellowy jaundiced look to it. Well, the reason for that is because we've lied to the camera. We lied. We told the camera that we should be on a outside lighting white balance. We told the camera to change the white balance to 5600, which is for white outside light. Now, if Carafa was to turn and aim that camera up at the windows, what color are the, is the light coming through the windows, guys? You'll notice that it's a natural white light, correct? That's because that's the actual setting that the camera's on. When you come back to me, you'll notice clear as day that I am very yellow. This piece of paper looks very yellow, okay? Now, Dave, go ahead and flip us back to 3200. When he corrects the white balance on the camera, you'll notice that this paper looks white, my skin tone looks correct, and so on. So white balance is really important with a professional camera. And if you own your own DSLRs or your own camcorders, that's a function that you'll be able to control manually. On your phone, it's probably not something that you can manually control. Sometimes, if you go into the settings on your phone, you can learn about how to control some of those settings. 
Okay, next up after white balance is iris. So all of us have a iris in our eyeball. It controls how much light is coming in. An example of this would be if you go to see a movie, matinee movie during the day and a hot summer day, you go into the movie theater, you're in a dark movie theater for two hours, and then you come outside and you're like, whoa, and you're blinded by the amount of light coming in. That is your eyeballs, your iris, adjusting to the influx of light. And then after a few moments, maybe you see some spots, but your eyes adjust, okay? That's your eyes natural iris. Cameras also have an auto iris or a manual iris setting. Iris controls how much light is coming in. So you can open up your phone. I want you guys to get your phones out. Open up your, your camera app. And I'm going to show you just on my own phone here. Karafa's going to zoom in. You can see this shot that I have on my phone. Now if I tap on the screen, there's a little light bulb or a sun that appears. I could drag that down if I want it to be darker. You guys should see my phone getting really dark. I could also tap it up if I need it to be brighter. And I could go really bright. And that's crazy bright. Okay? So even with a phone that has automatic iris, you could still have some control. And that's going to be part of your learning process of how to actually fully use the capabilities of your phone. You're going to play around with your phone and play around with the settings and mess around and see what you could do with it and get creative. When we talk about iris on a professional camera, it's more important than just how bright or how dark things are. It also has an impact on what is in focus in your shot. So when you have a professional camera or like with a DSLR, a photo camera, the control of your iris, or in photography terms, it's known as aperture, the control of that also determines how much of your shot is in focus. And that's a thing called depth of field. So if you have a really open iris, or your aperture is open all the way, it's going to make your depth of field shallower. It means the distance that is in focus in your shot is going to be shallow. If you close down your aperture or close down your iris, yes, it will get darker, but you'll also have more of the shot in focus. So that has an impact. Now, does that have an impact on your phone camera? Well, that really depends on what model you have. But I'll give you an example, and, and I'll ask a quick question. If you have a phone that has portrait mode, give me a thumbs up. So the ability to do portrait mode is basically, on your phone, it's a simulation of depth of field. And we're going to get into that when we talk more about focus. But the reason why I bring that up is because this is one of those times where I want to show you what it would look like on a professional camera so that as we get into things, you'll have a sense of how this works. And you might be able to use these techniques with your phone, but you might not. And if you, if you can't, I don't want you to worry about that because there are other ways to simulate it. But I want to show you how this works on a professional camera. Okay? So right now you guys should be able to see me okay. Um, Dave, go ahead and crank open the iris. I'm going to turn on my light, <clears throat> which I haven't had on yet. So now we have all the lights on in the, in the lab. Um, and you should see me now, and I should look very bright, like, ha ha, like that kind of bright, right? So that is overexposed. It means that we are letting in too much light. Overexposure is usually not a good thing. Unless you're making like a fan film of the video game Fallout and you want everything to look like it just got nuked, this is probably not a good look. So what do we do? Well, we have to adjust our iris. Now let's go to the opposite extreme, Dave. Let's close it down. Okay, so the iris is almost all the way closed. What f-stop are you at? 12. F12. But you guys can still see me, can't you? The reason why you can still see me is because I have a professional LED light up here. Let's find out what happens as we gradually turn lights off. So I just turned off the professional LED light. You guys can still see me, yes? I'm going to turn off the house lights. That's the main fluorescence. Just got a lot darker, didn't it? 
Okay, now I'm going to turn off the last light, which is the lowest wattage light that we have. Now I'm standing in this room and the only light that I have is ambient light coming through the windows from outside with the shades closed. But I could still see everything in this room. Can you guys see me very well? This is obviously the opposite of overexposed. This is called underexposed. Now Dave, open up that iris all the way. Okay, hey, I'm back, look, there's me. But is that a good shot? Is that properly exposed, guys? No. So what can we do? If, if, if this teaches you anything, it teaches you that you always need to think about camera and lighting at the same time. They are permanently married. They are permanently intertwined. Your lighting affects your camera. Your camera affects your lighting. Your lighting is important, okay? Let's say that I can't turn on any more lights. Let's say we're on a shoot and this is the best location for the shoot. I can't bring in any more lights. I can't get creative with anything else. Some cameras have gain, which is a boost to the video signal. But gain comes at a cost. Go ahead and hit me with a gain. So this is one stop up at 6 dB. It just lightened up the image a little more, right? Go ahead, flip the switch. Okay, now Dave just bumped it up again. Now you guys can see me again, right? but it's at a cost. When you boost the gain, you lose video signal. How many of you guys have ever seen like movies or, or things where they show people wearing like night vision goggles? You know, like army things or you played a video game with night vision and everything kind of looks all like pixelated and, and like there's lots of video artifacts and it's all like green. The reason why night vision looks like that is because basically night vision is a video camera with the gain jacked through the roof so it loses all the color information. It gives you more visual at, visual at nighttime, but it's at the expense of all your video quality and color information. Okay, now leave the settings where they are, Dave. The iris is open all the way, guys. The gain is up all the way. And all I did just now was turn on the house lights. These are just the lame fluorescent lights in the room. Do you see how overexposed I am? There we go. This is all the same lighting that I had before I messed with all this stuff. But do you see the impact that you can have in your camera settings and how much of a difference lighting makes? All right, kill the gain first. Now, even with the gain down all the way, it's still a little bit overexposed. Now fix your aperture. Okay, now we're back to normal. Now things look how they should look. Um, so iris is important, and it's something that even with your phones, you guys can control and you can think about. And it can start by you thinking about where you are shooting and the direction you're shooting in and how much of a difference that can make. Everything that you're gonna learn in terms of guerrilla filmmaking and how to take advantage of the tools that you have, so much of it is gonna be about thinking, critically thinking and creatively coming up with solutions. So the next thing on your sheet is zoom control and focus control. On a professional camera, zoom is on the right side, focus is on the left because you're holding a camera up on your shoulder usually and the zoom is where your right hand is gripping it and the focus is where your left hand is steadying the lens. That's how all professional cameras are built. It doesn't matter if you're a lefty or a righty. It doesn't matter if you bought it from a Japanese company or a European company or a North American company. All camera companies make their cameras with the same build configuration. Right is zoom, left is focus. If you're on a studio camera, you might have a studio camera with two arms. The arms on the studio camera, right would be focus, or sorry, right would be zoom, left would be focus. So it's consistent for that reason. They're all built the same way. Big or small, they're all built the same way. So a tripod is a way to stabilize your shot. You guys all understand that a tripod is, is something that's used in film and in video, in television and on movie sets. And they could be as small or as large as you need them to be. 
So this is an example of a stupid little plastic tripod that you can get for $25. Zoom in on my phone clip. And this is like a little $8 phone clip that allows you to use a tripod. So I could just pop my phone in there and now my phone is on a tripod. Why are tripods important? Because they give you stability. So I can move smoothly. I can get a nice smooth shot, tilting up and down, panning left and right, or I could just leave it and hit record and get a nice static, clean shot that's not shaky. Tripods are also useful on bigger cameras, okay? So right below on your sheet, right below tripod is the word dolly. You see these wheels on this? This is one of our um, 4K studio cameras. So this is a camera on a tripod that's also on a dolly. What that does is it gives me mobility. So in a television studio, you might have a camera here and the director might be like, I need you to go three feet to the right, truck right. Okay, so now I could get that shot. It allows me to kind of move my equipment around the studio, but it's not smooth. So a television dolly is just made to help you move heavier equipment, but it's not really made for a nice smooth shot. So what I wouldn't want to do is be recording a scene and try to make a nice smooth shot. For that, you would need a movie dolly. So the kind of dollies that they use on film sets, like movies and, and TV show sets and music videos, those are a totally different thing. First of all, movie dollies are built on tracks. So typically these are metal tracks that are laid out by professional people. They get a level, they go down the track. It's like a set of train tracks that they, they build, it's modular. So it can be as long or short as they need. There's curve pieces, all sorts of stuff. They build this thing together. They level it. If it's not level, they put wood shims under the track so it's perfectly level. They wipe down the track, they spray it down with silicone uh, lubricant, and then they put the dolly on the track. Now a dolly itself in a film world could be a sheet of plywood with four sets of skateboard wheels that aim in and grip the track. And then you could put tripods or whatever you want on that and you could roll it up and down the track nice and smoothly. On a bigger set with a bigger camera, they even have dolly cars. And it's like literally like it has a chair for the camera operator and a pedestal and an arm so you can move the camera around. And there are people who push your little car, your dolly car, on the track. So if you've ever watched a movie or a TV scene or something where it looks like somebody's walking along smoothly and the camera's just floating along parallel with them, that's probably a dolly shot. So there's a difference between a television studio dolly, like those wheels, and then a smooth film dolly. Um, and there are people who make their own. If you went to YouTube and you're like, poor man dolly, you could find tutorials for how to make your own dolly out of like PVC pipe and a sheet of plywood and skateboard wheels for like under $100. Um, there are also other stabilizers. So some of you guys might even have your own. Um, there, are, there are little gimbals where it's like a handheld pistol grip and you have a mount for your phone and you could just walk around and it just kind of balances your phone on a little gyro balance and it gives you this smooth kind of motion. Uh, there are heavier things like for, for real cameras where you know, maybe it's the size of a, of a car wheel, like a Movi or a Defy. Um, and some of the drone makers have come out with gimbals that allow you to use smaller cameras. And then at the, the biggest side, you have Steadicams. And those can be full body rigs where the Steadicam operator literally puts on a whole vest like Iron Man and has this gimbal arm that comes out and the camera sits on that and they have to walk around and move, but the camera just floats through the air. So there are a lot of ways to stabilize things, but tripods are the easiest way to stabilize something. Now, what if you don't have a tripod? What if you don't have a gimbal? You can stabilize your shots just by being creative, okay? So say you're shooting around your house like you're gonna be doing in the next two days and you need a steady shot. You could take your phone out and find something like a table or a desk and balance yourself. I'm just gonna move some things around here. Okay, so here I am. I want to get a steady shot aiming this way. I'm going to frame up my shot. And if I'm just holding this on a table and I record, automatically it's going to be less shaky because it's on a solid surface. But let's say I don't want to be touching it at all. I could set up my shot 
and find something like my Taco Bell um, drink cup to lean it up against. I could hit record and then I could go act in my own scene if I wanted to. Or if I just wanted a steady shot of something, I could just get a steady shot. And then come back, stop recording, now I've got my shot. I've even seen people improvise with pillows, blankets, shoes. I could take my shoe off, make sure that the camera side is sticking out, stick this in my shoe, put my shoe wherever I want it to, like in a tree branch or whatever, frame up the shot, and then set it and hit record. So you can improvise in a lot of different ways. But it's all about thinking about what kind of shot you need and why you need that shot, and then how do you get that shot, okay? And all throughout the semester, I'm gonna give you guys little tips for how to do that stuff. But the, the real key that I want you to think about is what can you do with what you have? And how do you take the most advantage of that? All right, so let's talk about the camera moves. So the first thing on the list is pan. So let's practice this first move, a pan. Moving the camera head horizontally, pan left and pan right. So here's what it looks like, and then Dave's gonna demonstrate it. So I'm panning left. I'm panning right. I want you guys with your app open to pan left and pan right. Okay, interesting. So if you look at my shot, this is what it looks like when you're panning left and right across me. I'm not moving, the camera is not physically moving. Now, some of you I noticed were doing this, kind of moving your arms and your torso to do the pan. That's cool. You could also do this. Try just using your wrists, just very minimal. You could still get maybe not as wide of a pan, but you could still get a nice little pan, okay? So if you try that, you do a little pan, pan left, pan right. It comes back to thinking creatively. What do you need for the shot? Maybe sometimes you need to do this whole thing. Maybe sometimes you just want a slight little bit of a pan or a little bit of a move. It's okay. It comes down to what you need for the shot. But that's a pan, and a pan is one of the most standard movements, and it's gonna be something you practice for homework. All right, tilt. Tilting is when the camera head tilts up and down. So tilting down, tilting up, tilting down, tilting up. Try both ways. Try it with your arms and then try it with just your wrist. Tilt up, tilt down. And you can see what Karafa is doing with our camera. Tilting up, tilting down. So panning and tilting are not always separate things. Let me give you an example. Um, literally every time we shoot sports, I have to combine panning and tilting. So somebody's down here, they throw the ball up into the air, I wanna follow the ball and bring it down to there. That's simultaneously panning right and tilting up. Or maybe you just have a shot where something's down here and you wanna to go to up there. So you start off down here, you pan left and tilt up. Or you start off up there, you tilt down and pan left. It's, it's, it needs to be fluid. And the only way to achieve that, you guys, frankly, it's just like gym class. It's like gym class with expensive equipment. You have to practice it over and over. You have to practice moving with the camera until your movements are smooth. You have to breathe in a calm way. A lot of times when people are filming stuff, they tense up, they lock up because they're so concentrated on getting the shot right that they actually tense up their muscles. So my tips when you're trying to train your body to become an effective machine to facilitate your camera movements is just breathe, try to stay relaxed, try to keep your muscles loose, and practice the shot that you're doing or practice the move you're doing. I could do this all day long. I could pan left and right all day long, tilt up, I could move around, and I could always keep my camera's horizon smooth and not be shaky because I'm calmed down, I've trained my muscles. It's kinesthetic, just like in gym class, it's a muscle memory thing. Same thing with moving with the camera. If I'm zooming in with my feet and I'm walking towards someone, I have to train myself to walk smoothly and not to bounce a lot. We all have a little bit of swagger when we walk. It's in our body mechanics. Our legs, our spine, our hips, all of us have some movement in our body, a little bounce in our step. But you have to kind of go against that to train your body to hold this camera steady 
and at an even horizon when you're walking in towards a subject and you want your shot to be smooth or when you're walking away, when you're backing up. It takes practice, just like in gym class. So that's part of what we're gonna be doing. So a truck is when you have a camera on wheels, don't, you don't need to do it. So here's my camera, it's on wheels. If the director says truck right, I'm still aiming forward, I'm still shooting forward, but my whole camera is going to the right or going to the left. That's truck left and truck right. Now, can you do that with a camera even that's handheld? Absolutely. So here I am, I'm standing up, I'm filming. I'm filming you guys and now I'm in a truck right. Now I'm in a truck left. Truck right. So I'm still filming, I never stop filming in that direction, but I'm moving to the left or right. This is very different from a pan, you guys, because when you're panning, you're kind of still and the camera head's moving. But a truck, the entire shift, the plane of what you're shooting changes. Okay, the next thing on the list after truck is dolly. That's a movement where you're going towards or away from your subject. So if I'm on a camera on wheels, this is dolly in. I'm dollying in towards my subject. I'm dollying out. I'm still shooting straight ahead, but I'm either moving closer to or further away. Guess what? Dollying in and out when you're handheld with a phone is the same thing as zooming with your feet. Dollying in. Dollying out. Same process. Some tripods have a pedestal, which is like a, uh, an extension. It's a neck that allows the head where the camera is to go up or down, okay? Now some tripods don't have this. When you're doing um, any video shooting with your phone, do you have a pedestal? Sure you do. It's wherever you put this camera. So if I'm holding it down here and I want a pedestal up, I just move it up to this area or I pedestal it down, but it's still filming forward. That's the thing. It's not the same, like this is tilting or tilting up and down. This, I'm still aiming forward, but I'm just changing the vertical height of where my camera is. So that's the same thing whether you have a tripod with a pedestal or if you're just doing it handheld. All right, let's talk about zoom. When you zoom in, if you don't do anything, this is what's gonna happen, okay? Go ahead and just straight zoom in, Dave. What you get is a nice shot of my gut, which is not really what you probably want. So zoom out. So the first note I want you to take is when you zoom in, you have to tilt up. So zoom in, comma, tilt up. So you'll notice that as he was zooming in, he was tilting up. Why? Because you want to keep my head in the shot. When we watch people on a screen, we're looking at their eyes. We're looking at their face because that's the part that's talking to us, that's engaging with us. Eye contact. So when you zoom in, you tilt up. Now, the opposite for your second note is gonna be when you zoom out, you need to tilt down. Here's what happens when Dave goes from a close up without tilting down. Go ahead and zoom out all the way. So you see me in the shot, but what's the problem? The problem is there's a, like 16 feet of space above me, which is not necessary to the shot. So zoom back in. So the second note is zoom out comma, tilt down. So watch the screen. Dave's gonna zoom out and gradually as he's zooming out, he's gonna smoothly tilt down. And what this does is it keeps me in the center of the frame. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So you might be saying, well, yeah, Mr. Allen, that's with a professional camera. It's the same thing as if you were walking in on someone. If I took this, and you're gonna practice this at home with like a family member or a friend, if you take your camera and you line up a shot, as you're walking in towards that person, you do have to tilt up, otherwise you'll cut off their head. And the same thing as you're walking away from them, you have to tilt down, okay? The next batch of notes has to do with my three tips for getting a shot in focus. Step one, zoom in all the way on your subject's eyes. Actually, I'm gonna stand a little closer so I can make sure you guys can see this. Okay, so step one is zoom in all the way on your subject's eyes. 
Now, if you can't get exactly into their eyes, that's fine. Get as close as you can. The, uh, the idea is zoom in all the way. Step two is focus. So if you look at the shot, Dave just racked the focus. Go blur it again so they could see this. So you zoom in all the way, it's probably out of focus. Go ahead and focus. Once you see their eyes and their face or whatever is in, sh in focus, step three is zoom out and establish your shot. Now, those three steps that I just told you about, you guys, zoom in, focus, zoom out, you're not going to use those with your phone. So you might be like, well, Mr. Allen, why the hell did you have us write down those notes? Because at some point, you will have exposure to real equipment. And when you have that opportunity, I want you to remember those three easy steps. Because those three easy steps, you will do a thousand times on one shoot. And I'm not exaggerating. Anybody who's been through this class before and has done a truck shoot, any time that you go on a film shoot, you always check your focus. In a given shoot, every time someone moves away from the camera or towards a camera, you have to refocus. So think about that in any one of those sports. All of those sports have movement. Every time the person you're shooting moves farther away from your camera or towards your camera, you have to refocus. So every time you're zooming in, racking your focus, and zooming back out. You will do this a thousand times. You'll do it so many times you won't even think about doing it anymore. It'll, it'll become automatic. All right, let's talk about headroom. So I'm standing here. Karafa has a shot of me. He's going to zoom in to a close-up. And he's going to leave headroom. So headroom is just the amount of space in the frame above a person's head. Okay? And that, it's pretty basic to film and television. You always want to have headroom. What happens if you have not enough headroom? Well, it basically means you're cutting off someone's head. What about too much headroom? Unnecessary space above your subject. Headroom is important whether you're shooting a film, whether you're shooting a live concert, uh, whether you're shooting sports or a talk show. Headroom's kind of one of those things that our brains, we have an expectation when we watch something and when there's too much headroom or not enough, subconsciously, we know that that's off. We know that it's wrong. Okay, now the other thing on the sheet below that is lead room, also known as looking room or nose room. Lead room and nose room is the amount of space that you leave in a shot when someone's talking to someone else who's off screen. So for example, I'm going to pretend to talk to Karafa over here. And I'm going to be like, now listen, Karafa, we have to go to Taco Bell again because I got to get that, that Crave Pack. Those burritos just hit different for some reason. I don't know why. We got to go to Taco Bell. So you see how I'm looking this way? And what he did was he left room in the frame in front of me. That implies for you guys, when you're watching a movie scene or a TV show, it implies that someone is off screen. And that looking room, that looking space is crucial because the next shot of the other person, let's say that's me over here, and I'm like, Bill, I don't know, man, because Taco Bell does something different to my stomach sometimes. Then I got to go to the bathroom for like an hour. I don't know about that, man. Lead room, looking room, nose room. It's the space in front of a person in the direction in which they're speaking. But is it only for movie scenes? No. We use lead room and looking room for sports, too. Think about it. Any sport where one person or one team is going in a direction, you have to lead that lead room. I'm a guy with a football. -na 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 -na. This is the lead room in front of me. Lead room in front of me. I'm the person with the basketball. Bounce, 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 bounce. I'm the swimmer. Lead room in front of me in the direction I'm swimming. I'm the diver. Let's see if Karafa gets this one. I'm the diver, Dave. Yeah, there you go. Boing. So not only for diving, not only do we leave lead room to see where they hit the water, but we leave extra headroom. Why? Because diving board, because they go boing and they go up. We don't want to miss that arc. We want to see the whole dive. Framing. 
All right, let's get into camera shots. Ready? Extreme close up, Dave. What? what? Let's say I'm shooting a movie scene and you want to show me going into the door and you're like, who opened the door? Oh, it was the man with the scar on his left hand, right? That's an extreme close up. When it, when it shows the person in one shot walking up to the door and then it cuts to the, to the handle and the hand opening that door, that's an extreme close up. It could be a feature of your outfit. Maybe uh, the person is wearing exceptionally amazing shoes. And so you zoom in and you're like, wait, what? Are those Star Wars slippers? Mr. Allen is the most boss of all dads. A close-up is one of the most common shots that you will ever see in any movie or TV show. If I gave you a homework assignment to pick one episode of your favorite show and count the amount of close-ups, I think you would be shocked. When people are talking, we need to pay attention to their face area. It is human nature. It is, in fact, it's beyond human nature, it's animal nature. Anybody have a dog? Give me a thumbs up if you got a dog. Yeah, what is your dumb dog? I have a dog too. What does your dumb dog do when you like come and talk to it and you're like, hey, Scooter, do you wanna go to the park and chase squirrels? He doesn't know what your English words are, but that dumb dog is looking at you like this, right? Like, because we make eye contact, mammals, all animals make eye contact to determine intent. It's a basic primordial instinct thing. It's like that thing in our, our beast brains where it's like, are you trying to eat me or are you a friend? That's what it is. It's intent. So when we communicate, we make eye contact. Here's a phrase. First person to finish it gets a Tootsie Roll when we come back to school. Ready? The eyes are the window to the... The eyes are the window to the soul. They tell so much about what we're thinking, emotion, motivation, whether someone's being deceptive or not, whether they're being truthful, right? Whether they're suspicious or whether they're angry. So much of facial expression is close-ups in movies, in TV shows. But I won't even count this as official homework, but just for your own edification, watch an episode of a show. Like it could be a short thing, like a 24 minute episode of Parks and Rec and watch that show and count how many close-ups there are. It will shock you. Okay, after close-ups we have medium shot. Why would I go to a medium shot when I have the close-up? Here's why, because you might have someone in a scene who is gesturing wildly and the gestures are important or maybe they're juggling or I don't know what they're doing, but a medium shot gives you a little bit of that close-up vibe where you could still see the person's face and their expression, but you get a little bit of a wider frame so you could see their movements. They could even move a little bit back and forth in the frame if they're you know, an antsy person or a pacer or they, I don't know, like they just have ADHD and they can't stop moving and they move a lot around when they talk and blah, blah, blah. You have more in the frame to work with when you have a medium shot. Long shot or a full shot is head to toe of your subject. So here I am in the room. You see me from head to toe. I could, I have, look how much space I have. <whistles> plenty of space. I could do a little dance, plenty of space in the frame. Okay, so full is head to toe, wide, go. That's it. Not much of a move, but the difference is crucial. A full shot still focuses your audience's attention on the person. When you go to a wide, you're just covering everything. Whatever's going on in the side over here, the background, uh, somebody's going through the file cabinet, anything that's in the shot is now fair game. A wide shot covers a lot of things. Sometimes that's good. If there's a lot of important crap going on in whatever you're shooting, it's good to have a wide shot. Hey, here's a thought, how many sports Use a wide shot as the main camera. All of them, trick question, all sports. The main camera that's on the most, that you see the most, is the wide shot. That's the game cam. Basketball, football, volleyball, swimming, lacrosse, water polo, softball, baseball, all of them, wide shots. So that you don't miss the sport. Now, do they cut away to different cameras? Yes, of course, that's what keeps it interesting. But 
the wide shot covers the main part of whatever game you're shooting. But if you have a scene for a music video or a movie and you don't want to show any distracting crap that's going on, you don't probably want to be in a wide shot. Does that make sense to all of you? You will learn more about this as we watch examples and practice these skills ourselves. All right, we come at last to the group shots. These are sometimes known as two shots, three shots, uh, four shots. It doesn't really matter what you call them. The idea is that you have a group. And a director might say, give me a group shot um, or give me a two shot. So I'm going to pretend that this 4K studio camera is my friend. And I'll be like, what's up, Tim? How's it going? What have you been up to lately, homie? Um, so there's a two shot of me and Tim, the camera. Okay, we might be doing something where we're covering um, sports. Okay, you're you're looking at the football game, and it goes into a timeout, and the the Hinsdale Central Red Devils go over to their huddle, and the LT Lions go to their huddle. The director would say to cameras one and two, "Give me group shots of the teams." So each of those cameras would zoom in. One of them would get the Red Devils, one of them would get LT, and they'd have a whole shot of the entire group in their huddles. Uh, what's another example? Um, concerts. We're shooting a band concert. The director says, I need a group shot of the trombones. So you're going to zoom in and get as many of the trombones as you could fit in your shot. Or the director might say, I need a group shot of uh, the percussion. Give me a group shot of the flutes. So all of those are different kinds of group shots. And the director will tell you what kind of shot to get. But you kind of have to be listening, concentrating, thinking, and using your eyeballs to look and find those shots. No matter what shot it is, you have to think, you have to look. So the stylized shots, you guys, are things that you have seen thousands of times in TV shows and movies. And we're going to try to replicate it here. So the first one is over the shoulder. And you guys have seen this on TV shows, in the news, uh, for sports. So for an example, I'm going to say that Carafa is on the field after the big game interviewing me about my performance in the big game. You see him in the shot. You see over his shoulder, and you see the microphone, and I'm the one talking. So who's the focus? Me. But he is in the frame. That's an over the shoulder. But you also see this in movie scenes all the time. So in a movie scene, I'm not going to be looking at the camera like I am right now. I'd be looking at the person in the frame, and I'd say, Krafa, we need to figure out a way to rob the next shipment of Taco Bell. And then the camera would flip around to the other side. Krafa's taller than me. There we go. And then, and then maybe it would be like, and I'd be like, do you understand the plan? And Karafa would shake his head. And then it'd go back to a shot of me. So the, the, the benefit of a shot like an over the shoulder is that it gives your audience context, right? Because you're thinking to yourself, well, Mr. Allen, you just told us that the close up is the ultimate shot. Why? Why must we use the over the shoulder? You got to mix it up. Variety. And the over the shoulder is a great way to give your audience a sense of the connection between the two people in the shot and of the space that they're in. How many of you guys can think of a TV show or a movie that had a scene where two people were in a restaurant talking and they used over the shoulders? Restaurant, bar, whatever, right? It, it's pretty easy to find it because it's everywhere. And over the shoulder in a movie scene is, is very common. And it's most common when you have a group of people or even two people who are kind of interacting in a scene and they want to have something more than just close up, close up, close up, close up, close up, cutting back and forth, right? So they break that up by integrating some other shots. And some of those other shots might be medium shots. They might be over the shoulders. And there's a lot of different ways to shoot a scene, but that over the shoulder can be really crucial if you need to have a shot where you want to establish a relationship in size between people or a relationship metaphorically between people. And what I mean by that is 
just by changing the angle on the over the shoulder, you can make one person appear more powerful or more impressive and the other person appear small. So those are just some things to think about. I'm just planting seeds for you guys to think about those things. Okay, here we are. We're on a level camera shot. A Dutch angle is when the camera changes horizon line. Okay, so why and how? Why would you do this and how would you do this and maybe when would you do it? So anytime that you wanna convey a disturbance in reality, a Dutch angle is a great tool. So take nice, easy Dutch, okay? So you've seen movies where somebody had too much to drink or they're on a lot of drugs or they got hit by a poison dart in the neck. You've seen this, right? And they're like, oh. Now you've also seen Dutch angles where like it's you know Pirates of the Caribbean and their ships being shot and they're, oh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> right? But then you could use them creatively in other ways too. So maybe you're shooting a concert or a music video and somebody's shredding an amazing guitar solo. All right, the next thing is rack focus. So rack focus is one of those things that usually requires a lens. But the cool thing is that some of you guys have the ability to do that with your phone. And that's part of the reason why I want you to mess around with your phone settings when you're kind of learning what your phone can do, okay? So on a rack focus, basically it's when you change what's in focus between the foreground and the background. In the background, you guys should see the little blinking lights and the hard drives from our channel rack. You guys see that? That's what's currently in focus and my face is out of focus. So that's in the background and I'm in the foreground. A rack focus is when you don't zoom, you just change focus. So he's gonna turn the focus ring until my mouth is in focus. Hmm. Okay, now rack back to the background. Rack to the foreground. Now this is not particularly fascinating, interesting, or even part of a story, but it could be. I'll give you another example. You could have a shot where, you know, you have a person at their locker and like maybe she's like had a really rough day and then you rack focus without panning, tilting, or zooming, you rack focus and in the background down the hall is her arch enemy who is like a mean girl who's like plotting against her. So, or you know, maybe you have a person who's like walking along and they stop and they're kind of like looking around like they heard something and over their shoulder you rack focus and you notice there's like a dude with like a bow and arrow about to fire the, the bow and arrow or like a sniper rifle or maybe just an egg in a non-violent school appropriate way. So a lot of creative ways to use rack focus and it's about controlling the plane and the space that you're shooting in and it doesn't really involve changing the frame because you're not zooming, panning or tilting you're literally just changing what's in focus within a single frame. So it's kind of a cool thing. One of the reasons why DSLRs went from being photo cameras to actually being used by filmmakers is because they were a cheap way to get a cinematic look. Because with a real photo lens, you could achieve a shallow depth of field for a pretty cheap cost. And when these started to be able to shoot pretty decent video, it was a no-brainer. People started using DSLRs, which are photo cameras, to make films. So that shallow depth of field, that look where you have a, um, a foreground that's in focus and a background that's really out of focus, there's a term for it. It's a Japanese term called bokeh. And bokeh is just a generic term that just means the blurriness of an image. So that bokeh look is part of the cinematic style, the filmic style um, that so many people associate in their brain library as being with something related to movies because we've watched so many movies and even other things like, like I said, like music videos, um, short films, that kind of stuff. And bokeh kind of gives it that cinematic look. Now, Portrait mode on a phone is 
best used if you're doing it as a still image. But you could still achieve some of that vibe, right? If you find the right kind of location where there's a lot of natural light and you get really close to your subject and get them in focus, most of the background will be blurry. When you use more professional equipment and you have the opportunity to use cameras that have actual control over depth of field, you'll have even more control over that. Um, is bokeh the greatest of all things? Is it the end all be all? Should every single shot that you have look like it's shot in portrait mode with bokeh? No. The answer is it's great when you have control, but it's not great all the time. And I'm gonna show you a crystal clear, crystal clear example of this, okay? So Karafa is gonna zoom in on me again, and you could see that I'm in focus and the background's out of focus, right? Problem is, is if I move too far away, I'm going in and out of focus. See, there, I'm out of focus. I've literally just moved two feet. That's it, example done. Just moving two feet away from or towards the camera changes the focus. So do you want to use a shallow depth of field and have bokeh when you're filming a scene where there's a lot of movement? No, you don't, because you'll be dropping focus all the time. So that look is cool if you can control the scene and the amount of movement in the scene. But if you were shooting something like sports or even just a documentary, let's say you're like, I'm going to go cover some big event that's going on in society right now and you're walking along with people and there's a lot of stuff going on that having a shallow depth of field is probably not the best choice because you want to be able to capture everything that's going on you don't want to be surprised so it's all about thinking about when to use things why you use certain things and how you use those things it goes back to what I said when I introduced this class, you guys. I want you to think critically and creatively. The best projects are the ones where people actually think through all the things and reasons why they're doing things and how to do them and when to do them to best create the story that you're trying to create. 